Good afternoon. Okay. I'm Clark Carter Presidential Library and Museum. I'm really excited that you all could, could join us today. On behalf of, of our director, Dr. Meredith Evans, I want to thank especially Cabin Creek Films and Greenwich Entertainment for making a screening of the uh, this film possible and also uh, to making the discussion uh, today possible. Uh, we're really uh, we're really delighted to have everybody here. In fact, when, um, uh, well, before I get to that, just a reminder, we are recording this. Um, we're trying to have everyone's microphone muted except the panelists uh, so that they can jump in as uh, need be. Um, I'm just really delighted. When we first talked, when I first talked to uh, Barbara about uh, showing her documentary, and doing a discussion, one of the things we would discussed is, you know, we could get a panel. And I thought, well, if we get a, a good panel of number of people, that would be great. And I thought, you know, we'll have the maker, the producers, and that will be great. And she said, we can do much better than that. And so that's what's happened. Uh, not only do we have two-time Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker Barbara Koppel with us, we've got two of the members of her team, Peabody documentary producer David Cassidy, and PBS, HBO, and Frontline documentary producer Eric Foreman. From the Carter administration, we're delighted to be joined by Vice President Walter Mondale, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, who was President Carter's uh, chief domestic advisor, and Jerry Rachoon, the uh, chief uh, uh, White House communications director. We have three members of the Delta uh, Force rescue team. Uh, Richard Taco Sanchez, Major Lewis Bucky Burris, and Ed Separate. And we are also pleased to have Foreign Service Officer and former hostage, hostage Mike Petrinko, um with us as well on this. So it's it's a great, great program. We're delighted to have you all here. I'd like to start out first with Vice President Mondale. Um, Mr. Vice President, what was it like inside the White House when um, the, the hostages were taken and then you have to decide what to do about it? I'm very glad we're doing this because this was an example of, of uh, seasoned, experienced uh, effort with uh, President Carter's vigorous involvement. And I think it's, um, it's a sign of, of, of American government at its best when we could we could handle it this way and make progress in this sense and do it without um, feeling um, inadequate or untrained or sort of foolish. Uh, this this was a serious effort, and I'm glad we're doing it. Can you explain? the frustration i guess um that you all felt that um you have all these hostages and what what led to the decision to to try and rescue them yes uh and um as you you, you just pointed out we had a lot of uh friends and hostages that were um under you might say under arrest by our by our hostile adversaries and we were trying to get them out of there and get them home uh they were uh and this is this is the story of what was it for 40 months or mm -hmm. maybe more i forget help me how many months was there it was 444 days we, we were working every day to try to get these young people home. Well, they weren't all young people. Stuart, maybe you can add to that. And I have muted your mic. You'll need to unmute your, 
your microphone. Um, but you could add to it about the the pressure that is felt on the administration during uh, during this time. Well, there was enormous pressure. The, there were several things leading up to this. Uh, first was uh, the absence of good intelligence by the CIA on what was happening internally within Iran. An utter absence of understanding, in part because the CIA was limited by the Shah to only doing intelligence externally on the Soviet Union, not internally. And all the reliance was on his own Savak intelligence. So the president and the vice president and the national security team simply did not get the kind of information they needed about the fact that the Shah's support rested on quicksand. He had been the darling of every president since 1953 when he was reinstalled on the throne. He had an open shopping list. And there was an utter lack of understanding of what was happening internally. Gary Sick, who was the NSC uh, expert, uh, put it to me from my book on President Carter that uh, we simply had a sea of a lack of knowledge, total, utter lack of knowledge of what was happening to our principal ally in the region. So you have to start with that. Second, the president gave a speech December 31st, 1977, New Year's Eve in Iran, calling Iran and the Shah ruling over a sea of an island of stability amidst the chaos of the Middle East. And that was the prevailing sense that Iran was an island of stability. It shows again the, the lack of uh, appreciation and understanding. Third, as I look back on the records and the information that came from our national security advisor, Brzezinski and Vance, uh, they, they did not alert the president and vice president to the crumbling domestic support. And by the time that came, uh, it was almost too late to see them absent a massive military intervention by the Iranians, which he, the Shah himself, did not wish. So then once the hostages were taken, there was a fundamental choice. Do you negotiate or do you use military force? Uh, at the first NSC meeting I participated in, I recommended a blockade or mining of the harbors. Uh, Brzezinski did likewise, a show of military force. There was not a lot of enthusiasm for that, either by his political team who said, for example, Ham Jordan and others, the only thing that would do is lead to the hostages coming back uh, in caskets. They might be shot. I didn't think that would be the case, but that was a legitimate concern. And second, the Pentagon was concerned that the Russians, the Soviets, in the midst of the Cold War, would use their mine sweepers to demine the harbors if we mine them, to try to ingratiate themselves to the new radical regime, and that we would have a confrontation uh, with the Soviet Union. So the fundamental decision was to negotiate. And that's where, again, the lack of understanding came. There were actually many agreements that were reached, but each one was vetoed by Khomeini because there was not an appreciation, Tony, of the fact that he was the real power, not his government, which was much more moderate and wanted good relations, that he was calling the shots and critically that the hostages were pawns in a domestic power struggle. It's misunderstood that when Khomeini came in, he was not all powerful. He had to consolidate his power and he used the hostages as pawns to consolidate his power. We were also misled by the fact that only two weeks after Khomeini came back, he came back February 1st, on February 14th, there was an attack by students on our embassy. Our ambassador Sullivan was marched away with, uh, with blindfolds. The government, the post Khomeini government, Barzagan, the prime minister, Yadzi, the foreign minister, immediately intervened and got the uh, ambassador uh, released and the crisis was over. And so the assumption was we were now on a somewhat even keel with the new government. And then the last decision, which the vice president should talk about, which was absolutely seminal, and I think he would agree, the president was the last holdout 
was admitting the Shah for medical treatment. Uh, everyone, including I think the vice president and the secretary of state who had reluctance to do so, finally came around to the notion that he was our principal ally. We had to do it. Uh, the fact is that he, the Shaw, got Brzezinski and David Rockefeller and a public relations firm to put a lot of pressure on the administration. How can you turn your back on an ally, particularly for humanitarian treatment? And the president said at the seminal meeting, okay, if we do it uh, and our hostages are taken, what would you advise happening then? And there was rather stony silence. So that was a really fundamental decision to, to admit him. And then we'll get later to the hostage rescue, which was a really courageous act by the president. But that's the lead up. It's very important to understand that lead up because the hostage crisis didn't occur out of thin air. One last point. Before the president admitted, again, being the last holdout, for the Shah to come for humanitarian treatment, he asked that we check with Barzagan and Yazi, the secular leaders, to see if they would intervene in the same way in February to protect the hostages. And they were less willing to do it, but they said, we'll do our best. And it's on that basis, assuming that they would act in accordance with international principles, in accordance with the way they did in February, that he finally reluctantly allowed the Shah back in. Vice President Mondale, what, what was your feeling, as Stuart mentioned, uh, what was your feeling about letting the Shah back in for medical treatment? Uh, I have been uh, very reluctant to do it. Uh, uh, up front, when we first started, I was opposed, but as these discussions went on, and um, we, I became more educated on the issues and I saw how many of my friends were on the um, other side. I slowly came around to the idea. Yeah. One of the jobs, Jerry Rafshoon, we've got you on the, the phone and you'll need to unmute your, your phone, but uh, you had to manage the, the conversation with the, uh, the public. Uh, how do you, uh, what kind of a task was that to, to let the public know uh, what, was, uh, what was happening? And Jerry, can, can you unmute phone. it? I can't unmute it. Jerry, can you unmute your phone? Just go down to the bar. It'll pop up. I'll tell you what. While, while Jerry's trying to do that, um, Mike Machenko, uh, Matrinko rather, it was, was actually in the, the embassy. He's on the receiving end of the... Uh, the hostages. Uh, Mike, what was it like there? I remember those times very clearly at the, some of my, um, I was tasked to ask some of my close friends what their reaction would be if the Shah was admitted to the United States. Uh, the first person I asked was the family of the Imam Jume of Tehran, the Friday prayer leader. He was the top-ranking clergyman in Iran, you know, in Tehran, in charge of all the, you know, the Friday prayer, et cetera, for the city. The response was, we don't care what happens to him. His days are over. If you want to bring him to the United States, it's okay. Um, that was an excuse that was used later by Khomeini's people. It was a pretext. We were going to get hit no matter what happened. There were other reasons for attacking the embassy. Uh, we knew it. We sort of suspected it would happen eventually. The problem was we thought it would happen just as it had happened the preceding February. A quick takeover, you know, a couple of demonstrators marching back and forth with uh, signs and posters, and that we would all then be released. It changed. The Iranian government was afraid of the Shah, but not really. What they were really afraid of was the various factions of the revolution going in a different direction than Khomeini and some of the clergy wanted. 
they had to attack us. They had, to, and once they got us and they got into the files, that was it. The opposition was decimated. Did when when they started rushing the embassy, Mike? What was going through your mind? My lunch plans, because I had to cancel them. My dinner plans, because I had to cancel them. The fact that somebody was waiting outside the rector of Isfahan University because he wanted to meet with me. Um, I was generally very, very annoyed. Annoyed is putting it mildly. And only then, as the crowd surged, and we realized they were starting to come into the building, they were no longer on the outside of the walls, they were over did it uh, get rather serious and uh, that's when i discovered that um, the friends i thought i had had i didn't really have uh, what do you mean yeah i placed a call to the office of the friday prayer leader and uh, oh he was dead by that point uh, i should say he had been ass assassinated although it was billed as a heart attack um, I called his son and said, do you know what's happening here? Ah, oh, the son's uh, security guard got on the phone, said, yes, we know what's happening. I said, can you do anything? He said, no, Michael, we're really very sorry. I said, can, you know, so-and-so, the son of the Friday prayer leader, talk to me now. And he said, Michael, he won't come to the phone. I'm really sorry. I personally am really sorry. Click. Wow. We've been set up. But it was using the Shah's arrival in the United States was important, but it was a great pretext we gave. And once they got us and they started, you know, really ramping up the investigation into the embassy, going into the files, we had thousands of pages of files there. Once they started getting into that, they managed to use them to round up all the people who were opposed to Khomeini. That's when a lot of the clergy also disappeared many of them to prison. Some of them basically uh, just, you know, deturbanized, as they say. Yeah. So bringing the Shah into the United States was a mistake, but it was not as important, I don't think, as the, the fact that it was going to happen anyway. It was a pretext. Sort of like when you don't want to go someplace and it starts to rain, so you can use the rain as the reason for not going. Yeah. Barbara, what, how did you get involved in telling this story? We were um, asked by the History Channel if we would like to do a project with them. And they were going to do a hundred uh, feature length uh, documentaries on history, some history that was little known about. And so we saw on the list Desert One, and we all decided this is what we want to do. Actually, history only did five of them, so we were really lucky that we got in early and were able to do it. And for me, I learned so much. I met so many incredible people, um, and it, it really changed me a lot to see that people have been carrying this with them for their whole lives, to see people who, you know, endured being hostage, people who gave up, were willing to give up their lives to get 52 hostages out. Mm -hmm. um, did we, do we start, is Jerry on? Hi, is Jerry Russian here yet? No, I'm having Cynthia try to get him off. Okay. Well, um, then, uh, as, you, as you go about making the film, how did you, what was the process for, for the people finding video um, of what happened? Yeah, we, we, we put a list, and David, you can chime in, or Eric, if you're there um chime in to at any time we put a list together of people we would love to interview we did research about them uh we started us uh, our archival uh with luann jones and then um eric and david stepped into it and that's how we went about doing it you know 
and Vice President Mondale was so wonderful. He really allowed us a lot of time with him and, you know, everybody on here did that. And so we just kept learning and kept struggling to see what else we needed to really tell the whole story. Yeah. And you ended up having to use a lot of animation to, yes. uh, to describe. Yeah, the mission was a secret mission. And so there wasn't even a photograph of the mission. So it would be hard to do with that kind of film without knowing. So we took the stories of everybody and combined them, the people who were on the mission to tell it. And we have a one, we had a wonderful guy who we called Z, it's our Todd. Uh, and he um, did the animation and the illustration. And he would come in and he would look at material that we were doing. Um, Eric and David and Luann would do research to see what the helicopters looked like or what the you know C-130s looked like or how if a helicopter hit the plane, what angle would it be at? I mean, we just did everything. We drove him nuts, <laughs> but we wanted to get it right. And the really wonderful thing is that so many of the people on the mission said, how did you do this? <laughs> this is what it was like. So it was great. Yeah, Bernie, can I try and just very quickly, sorry to interrupt. We weren't the first people to attempt to bring this story to the big screen. Um, people had written books, uh, long form articles. Um, and uh, so, you know, it was a matter of going back through work, you know, that had been done already and then doing new research. But um, I also just wanted to use this as an opportunity to thank you and the team at the Carter Center, you know, for hosting this event. But I think it's important to, to thank your archivist team. I, I worked, I wrote down who I was working with, Sarah Mitchell and Dr. Uh, Johnson Jones. I'm not sure if they're on the call, but thank both of them and the team at Preserve South. Uh, there are photos and footage in the film that came from your archive. So thank you and your team. Yeah. David, was there anybody that you couldn't get that you wanted to to have as part of this uh yeah film I'll, I'll i have a very easy answer on that and it goes to your prior point uh, a gentleman by the name of jim kyle wrote the book the guts to try which was incre an incredible history of operation eagle claw he was the air commander um an important man in in, in, in uh, planning this mission we did reach out to to to, to mr kyle and he declined to participate in the film, but we did use his research. Um, throughout that book, there's graphics. Uh, people wrote their own, their, the people wrote their own, um, they, they wrote like the positioning of the planes. And in our animations, we went back to all the research we could find, those little, those scribblings that, that they put together for the Gus to try, and we positioned them. If you look at those animations, they will match up to the positions that you'll find throughout that book. So um, that would be my answer for the one person. I think that if we had Mr. Mr. Kyle in the film, it would have uh, been a little bit richer. Yeah. Um when the when the rescue mission gets gets authorized, and as as I mentioned, we've got uh, members of the uh, the Delta Force here, uh, 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 Master Sergeant uh, Sanchez. What was it? Can you describe what you felt when you first heard that you all were going to go in and and try and rescue the hostages? Well, first off, we have to clarify something very specifically. Delta Force is Delta Force, and the biggest, baddest warriors right down there, Buck Burris. I was part of the Air Force. Delta Force was its own entity, and I'm here to tell you unequivocally, if we'd have got through that night, we'd have brought 52 American hostages home. Because there's no doubt in my mind, they knew what they were doing, and they were ready. But we had technical difficulties understand the situation in the United States military in the late 70s, especially special ops. They were defunding uh, everybody left and right, and their intention was to put uh, special ops in the reserves uh, or, or boneyard the airplanes, and the reason but was, and you know, it, it all goes post-Vietnam, is, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't like special operations forces after Vietnam, and then all of a sudden the hostage gets taken, and, you know, November the 10th, we started flying, uh, rehearsal missions you know they got took on the fort so i mean you're talking uh we started early up because this was through the pentagon you know that we were gonna you know have to go with it on any day happened to be six months 
And you know, quite frankly, as it went drug on and drug on and drug on, different iterations of night one, night two, dealing with blivets, uh, no technology. We created every bit of technology that there was during that six months uh, on how to fly NVGs. They came out just before that saying they were not even compatible with flying. How we survived flying with those on and landing, I'll be damned if I know why we're, any of us are alive. But, you know, when you get that six months and then all of a sudden you get told to go, it, it, you, your heart's pumping and you're ready because we've been practicing for a long time and we wanted to go get the American hostages. Now, I'll let Bucky to speak to Delta's reservations uh, on, on different pieces of it. But uh, Bucky was on my airplane when we went in at night. And uh, it was an adventure, uh, at least say, you know, Intel, uh, as Stuart said earlier, we didn't have much Intel uh over there for any kind of uh, reasons, uh, weather intel, uh, regular uh, human intel, or anything else. And we landed by, picked that road, and uh, supposed to be a, a very least traveled road. It ended up being, uh, you know, I-95 going up the West Coast, it seemed like. I mean, when you land on the ground, you ain't on the ground less than two minutes, you're dealing with a bus, 44 Iranians. It's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's an adventure. And uh, a lot of uh, fast moving thought processes at that time. And when you're dealing with them, and I'm pretty sure Bucky was the one over dealing with them initially, uh, from what I remember, uh, Wade Ishimoto was told, and Wade uh, was told to stop that uh, new vehicle coming down the road, which wasn't just a vehicle, uh, it happened to be a damn fuel truck. So within five to uh, eight minutes of being on the ground here we got 44 iranians and this massive fire but hey we're a clandestine covert but we continued on because you know didn't feel that was going to compromise and we were on the ground for a long time wait for the helicopters to show when they did they mostly you know the paul Horry rest of the story i just know when it's all said and done it's still very painful to this day we left 52 american hostages in the desert I mean, in Iran, and we left eight of our brothers, five Air Force and three Marines yeah. in the desert that the Iranians decided they'd like to parade the bodies around outside the embassy. That, yeah. that still sticks very, very hard with me. Major Burris, you want to jump in here with how you felt about um, the way the the rescue attempt was going and, and, and you know, when it was all falling apart? Well, I, I'd like to begin by backing up back to November when uh, we had just finished 18 months of intensive selection and very intensive training of a special operations force that Colonel Charlie Beckwith had, had envisioned ever since he'd been in the British Special Air Service as an exchange officer. And we uh, had about 90 guys that we had specially selected, trained very hard, we had a national uh, level validation exercise the night before the hostages were taken. And we happened to be, we passed it. You know, the FBI said they're, they're okay. The Brits said, okay, the French, et cetera. So we were drinking a little wild turkey and in came our CIA rep and said, hey, guess what? The uh, embassy in, in uh, Tehran has just been overrun by students. So the next day, Colonel Beckler sent me and, a, and another officer up to the Pentagon for this, uh, at the time, eight-person planning cell that the Pentagon was putting together. So we began planning uh, immediately back in November. Uh, the problem was that we had determined that you, one always had to have two rescue plans for hostage situations. One was an emergency assault plan uh, that would be executed in the event that that uh, the hostage holders began killing hostages, you know, one an hour or one a day or however. And then a deliberate assault plan, which would be the collection of all the intelligence we could have based on the amount of time that was available, gathering assets, uh, air assets, making sure they were trained, making sure the communications were compatible and all that. So it was, we we felt we were in, in pretty good nick as far as, uh, as the, the force being prepared to, to do the rescue itself. The problem was getting us in and getting us out. Uh, and that's 
that's what we recognize as a problem to begin with. Initially, the emergency assault plan was, uh, there was a lot of smuggling going on. The Soviets were still in Afghanistan, remember, and there was a lot of smuggling going across the border uh, between Tehran and, and uh, Afghanistan. And so we, our initial emergency assault plan was to parachute in, capture some of the trucks, go to the embassy, uh, rescue the hostages, and fight our way out of town. Now, that was a very, obviously, very, very iffy, risky operation. But if they start killing Americans and throwing them over the wall, we had to do something. I think that, that and I'm sure Vice President Mondale will, will, would agree that if that had started happening, then some of these punitive actions like uh, the Kraken Towers at Abadan Refinery, I know, was one of the things that was considered uh, destroying them with naval, with naval aviation and that sort of thing if they had started killing them. Uh, but that wasn't the case. As time went on, a number of hostages were released. We were able to gather much better intelligence about the situation inside the compound, the layout. Uh, and meanwhile, we had some guys training up to go in undercover, uh, both to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where Mr. Lang and, and one or two others were being held, and then the, the main embassy. Uh, these assets, one was uh, the late Dick Meadows, who was a famous Vietnam era Special Forces soldier. And the other was a young Iranian American who was actually a, a camera mechanic on, uh, on reconnaissance aircraft. But he did what he did, what, what Dick and his first name was Fred, what Dick and Fred did was was absolutely amazing. They went in, did a close reconnaissance. They managed to acquire uh, a warehouse. They managed to acquire a number of vehicles so that we uh, we could execute the mission, the, the deliberate assault plan. The deliberate assault plan, as I'm, everybody's seen the film, I guess, so you know what the plan was to have been. Uh, had we left Desert One, we would have gone to what was called Desert Two, which was the hide site where the helicopters would be camouflaged. And it was a remote area uh, northeast of Tehran, as I recall, in 40 years. Uh, and we would move by the vehicles that Dick and Fred had got us into this secure warehouse. We would, uh, early the next morning, conduct the assault on the embassy, go over the wall, uh, rescue the hostages, blow a hole in the wall, bring everybody out across the street to a soccer stadium. And 15 minutes after the assault began, the helicopters were to lift off and come to the from desert to to the stadium, pick up first the hostages and some medical personnel, then the the assault force and take them down to uh, Manzaria airfield where the Rangers would have secured the airfield and would have been waiting with medevac medical evacuation airlift to, to get them out of there. Uh, but that was the plan. Of course, we didn't get past Desert One. Uh, no one has mentioned the Haboob, this, this uh, a, a really bad dust storm that uh, created havoc both with the, the fixed wing aircraft, but particularly with the helicopters. In fact, one helicopter landed just after they coasted into Iran, and the air component, the, the helicopter component commander landed. The helicopter he was in picked the crew up and went back to the Nimitz, and we had no idea that that had occurred while we were sitting there waiting. Uh, eventually, the other six helicopters managed to make their way to the LZ, the landing zone, two aircraft at a time. I think the, the burning fuel truck probably helped them as sort of a beacon uh, to get there. But anyway, they came in immediately after that. One of the the aircraft, one of the, the pilots reported that uh, his aircraft was unserviceable. And I don't I, I'm not a helicopter guy, so I don't know the specifics, but it was not flyable. And uh, one of the things that we had and uh, considered in uh, the operation schedule, which is sort of a what if contingency plan list, 
I remember one line in that uh, stated that if we left the embassy with less than six helicopters, and it was a, all caps, abort. So the, the decision had really been pre-made that, that we were at that point to have turned back and try again another day or from another direction. Uh, unfortunately, when the helicopters were repositioned, so that was aborted, and we were started back. And unfortunately, one of the helicopters was repositioning to take on more fuel to get him back to the Nimitz when he, uh, because of dust storm and whatever other reasons, fate, uh, crashed into one of the one of the fuel birds, one of the EC-130 refuelers. And uh, as Taco said, we lost five great airmen, eight great airmen, five Air Force and three Marine Corps. Uh, all of the other C-130s, Taco's bird included, were running, were critically low on fuel. So we had to get out of there. We, you know, we, we uh, everybody was going to run out of gas. Unfortunately, the, even the fuel birds weren't, able, weren't capable of refueling themselves, even though they had 18,000 gallons of, of fuel that they were carrying. So we had to leave this this uh, conflagration that was that had killed by then eight eight of our comrades and leave Iran. It was a major. What's your feeling at that point? I'm sorry. At what's that your point, feeling at that point when you're having to leave when you can't do the mission? Well, when the it, what at that by that stage we had already, you know, as I said, we had the the abort order had already been given decision had been really pre-made uh, and I felt you know we can do we we'll, we've got to come up with a better way to get this done and we one of my jobs was to throw some pocket litter on the on the uh, landing zone Soviet parachute badges and a canister of film that uh, that showed some Soviet infantrymen around a tank uh, in what looked like Afghanistan, that sort of thing, in the hopes that after we left, when the Iranians showed up, found this stuff, they would have thought that the Russians had come across from Afghanistan and tried something. But unfortunately, once the crash occurred, uh, that was no longer possible, and the, the, the deal was done. The thing that bothered me most at that moment was not being unable to get to Tehran to do to, to do that mission, it was having to leave those eight men 